Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the approaches to valuing and understanding friendship that Cicero discusses in his work on friendship and which he considers to be misguided for a variety of reasons is thinking that we can't have deep, intimate, abiding friendships if we really want to have freedom in our life. We don't want to get too attached, people often say. I, I don't want to lend my heart to somebody if it might you know, lead to my feeling bad or even feeling worried about things. And, and he considers a number of interesting cases and situations and provides arguments for, for why it is that we shouldn't take that point of view. We should hold ourselves ready to become friends, at least friends with the right sorts of people, not just anybody, but people who have the potential for being genuine friends, people who we can see are, if not perfectly virtuous, at least on the way towards that state. And he criticizes these Greek sages or wise people. And I should, I should mention here that Cicero himself is a Roman and part of his larger project was to take the, the wisdom, the philosophy, the ideas from Greece that people were studying in Greek and put them into a Latin idiom to show not only that the Latin tongue could actually function as, as, as a vehicle for thought, but also that you could, you could do these sorts of things pretty much anywhere. You didn't have to be in Greece thinking in, in their modes. And so criticizing these Greek sages is a way of saying, you know, actually, maybe these, these Greeks didn't get everything right when it comes to friendship. And he, he says that, you know, uh, some of the things that they say seem, seem quite off base to me. He says, these are considered sages in Greece and they've approved certain views, which in my opinion are astonishing. So what are these sorts of views? There's several of them. One is that we should avoid having too much intimacy, too much attachment, too much connection within the scope of our friendships. Why? Well, there's, there's really two main reasons that he adduces, and both of these have to do with what we can call affectivity. Now, friendship itself is a pleasant thing, you know, when we're all getting along, but it also brings other feelings, doesn't it? So he talks about care or worry, or another way of translating it is anxiety. We, we worry about what other people are doing, what's going to happen to them. And so he says that it, it, we don't want it to be necessary for one person to be full of anxiety or care, silicatim, uh, for many people, for a multitude, pro uh, pluribus in, in this. So if we could say that we have enough things to worry about for ourselves, we don't need to worry or be concerned with what, what's happening to other people. We're better off if we, if we don't do that. We're free. We're free of care in that case. The other thing that he talks about is being bothered, being put out by having to, you know, be involved with other people's affairs or business. He says, each one of us has business of his own, enough and to spare. 
it's annoying to be too much involved in the affairs of other people. And so the suggestion here is, well, if you know, you don't want to have a unpleasant life, don't get too close to anybody. You can, you can have friends, you can have acquaintances, you can have connections, just, you know, make sure that you don't let anyone completely inside. And, and so the idea here, he follows this out and he says, it's best to hold the reins of friendship as loosely as possible so that we may either draw them up or slacken them at will. Now, what are the reins of friendship? The idea here is it's like riding a horse. The reins are the thing that you use to control it, right? The, the attachment. So there's kind of a double metaphor going on here. You, you, want to leave, you don't want to have the reins too tight so that the horse is, is you know, being rigid or anything. You let them loose. And then if you need to tighten them up, you tighten them up. And if you want to let them go completely loose, you, you do that. And so the idea is... Don't let your friends be too close to you and don't get too close to your friends and don't worry about them very much because, you know, if you really do need to worry about them, then you can tighten the reins or you might just let them go and say, oh, your problems aren't my problems. And so he says that uh, an essential of a happy life is freedom from care, not having to worry about everything. This, in, in Latin, it's securitas, Right. And we're going to come back to that in just a moment, this idea. So he says, the soul cannot enjoy it if one man is, as it were, in travail for many people. So you've got your own stuff to take care of. Just do that. Don't worry about anybody else. Or if you do, make sure that you're not too worried and you can always cut them loose if you, if you need to. So... Cicero doesn't think this is a good way to behave. He continues on and he talks about um, some people having a view of friendship. Now, these are not necessarily the sages. This is a whole bunch of other people who he says have kind of a, a bad view of friendship, a low view of friendship. They view friendship as being based on lack or need. You are friends with people because they supply what it is that you're missing. And we can think of all sorts of examples of this, right? You're friends with your neighbor because he invites you to the good parties and you like going to the parties and drinking his beer and eating his brats and all, all those other things. And so you, you stay friends with him, even though you really don't like the guy. And maybe you borrow his lawnmower every once in a while or his hedge clippers or whatever else it is that people do out in the suburbs, right? Or your friends, really lovers with somebody because... They can get you off. They can give you sexual pleasure that, that you could possibly give yourself something like that yourself, but it's better to do it with somebody else or there's things that they can do that, that you can't really do by yourself. That's the only reason you're connected with them. And if they stop doing that, end of the relationship, right? Or you're friends with somebody because they give you the answers to the test. And, and, and Cicero goes on and says that vulnerable people, given this point of view, would be the ones who would be in most need of friendship, those least endowed with firmness of character and strength of body. And so they would seek its shelter, the poor more than the rich, the unfortunate more than those accounted fortunate. So what if you are one of the people who's fortunate? Well, you don't need anybody then, do you? You just stay by yourself. Being self-sufficient or having, we used that word earlier, securitas, right? having security, having being well provided for means you don't have to have any friends because what are they going to do? They're just going to come in. You don't need anything from them. So why would you want to have them around? They're just going to actually create need and, you know, bother you by telling you about their day and what's going on and what they, they'd like to have. And, uh, you know, get them out of here. Get rid of them. It's better to be totally on your own because then you can be free. So once the delivery person has delivered your you know, stock of food and your game console and your big screen TV and hooked up your cable and connected your internet and done all those things, get them the hell out of there. You don't need any of those people around. Don't even bother talking with them. That's, that's sort of the advice here. Cicero thinks that that's not a good idea. And he says, he's being facetious here. Oh, noble philosophy. 
They seem to take the sun out of the universe when they deprive life of friendship. That which we have from the immortal gods, no better, no more, no more delightful boon. Because what's really going on here, he says, what value is there vaunted freedom from care? In appearance, it's often an alluring thing, but in reality, often to be shunned. So he says, It's inconsistent not to undertake any honorable business or course of conduct or to lay it aside when undertaken in order to avoid anxiety. So it's kind of ignoble. If we continually flee from trouble, we must also flee from virtue who necessarily meets with some trouble in rejecting and loathing things contrary to herself, as when kindness rejects ill will. And he goes on and he says that um, if we want to be good people, we have to be engaged with other people. There's going to be some other motives as well that he's going to get to a bit later that have more to do with pleasure. He, he then brings up uh, another interesting thing here about virtue. And he says, um, if distress of mind befalls a wise man, as it certainly does, unless we assume human sympathy has been rooted out of his heart, why should we remove friendship entirely from our lives in order that we may suffer no worries on, it account, on its account when the soul is deprived of... Now, here it's being translated as deprived of, of, of emotion. And the Latin simply says, um, you know, motu animu sublato, right? But, but the, the, the movement of the mind that we, we are seeing here is that of emotion, right? When the soul is deprived of emotion, what difference is there... I don't say between a a human being and beasts of the field, but between even lower, a human being and a a, a stick or a stone or any such thing. We become inhuman by depriving ourselves, by removing from ourselves the the care, the emotional connection with other people. We, We render ourselves less human, which for Cicero is not a good thing. We deprive ourselves of something very good in the process. And he says that there's people who think that if you're going to be virtuous, if you're going to be good, morally good, then you have to be uncompromising, a a real tough person. He says, some people think that virtue is hard and unyielding and as it were, something made of iron. And Cicero says, this is actually misguided. The person who conceives of virtue in that way and thereby pushes potential friends away, or perhaps their family members, or work colleagues, or whoever it's going to be, they're not really virtuous. Why? Because virtue itself becomes flexible and adaptable within the scope of friendship, which implies you can't really be completely virtuous unless you're actually within relationships. Very interesting idea there. So he he goes on and he says, In many relations of life, virtue is pliable and elastic so that it expands, so to speak, with a friend's prosperity and contracts with his adversity. And so, you know, he says, we shouldn't banish friendship from life uh, any more than we should reject virtue because virtue entails certain cares and annoyances. We We should look for friendship, even if it does mean being bothered by things. So Cicero is willing to admit, yes, friendship does involve care for others, sometimes worries about others, being preoccupied with their stuff, taking the the phone call at night that keeps you from being able to do whatever it is that you want to do or wakes you up in the middle of the night, Um, you know, helping people move, prime example, right, Uh, for the beer and the pizza that you're going to get afterwards. These are important things and they shouldn't lead us to devalue friendship in, in, in favor of being free. Now, he brings up the example of a guy, very famous, legendary even, in Greece named Timon, who was a renowned misanthrope. A misanthrope is a, is a person who doesn't like other people. Who, and I'll, I'll say something more. They actually hate other people. It comes from the word misos, which means hate, right? So they hate other people for whatever reason. And he says that even if someone were of a nature so savage and fierce as to shun and loathe the society of human beings, even such a person could not refrain from seeking out some person before whom he might pour out the venom of his embittered soul. 
Isn't that an interesting idea? He's not seeking out anyone to like enjoy him, his time with them. He's not seeking them out because he loves them or cares for them. He just wants to bitch about how terrible life is and how awful other people are. Haven't we seen people like this? I'm sure some of you have run across a few. I know I certainly have. They're only happy by being miserable and they like to spread that misery around. You can't spread that misery around without being at least somewhat intimate with other people. I mean, this is a little bit of a silly example, but think about the supervillains, right? They always got to reveal their plan to the hero, which usually results in the plan being foiled. Why the hell do they do that? Because they want to have somebody who they can convey their information about how they're going to blow up the world because they want to share it with someone, right? Cicero's not talking about that specifically, but he is talking about something quite similar. So they still want some, some other people. The last thing that he says has to do with solitude. Is solitude something that we really, really want? And he says, well, yes and no. So he, he goes on and says, imagine that a God would remove us from these haunts of human beings and put us in some solitary place. And while providing us there in plenteous abundance with all material things for which our nature yearns, should take from us altogether the power to gaze upon our fellow men. This is an interesting thought experiment. So imagine that, I don't know, some, some super powerful alien or a God or whatever you want it to be would put you in some place and you've got everything that you could possibly want, but no human beings. Would you be happy? A lot of people say, oh, man, I love it. I can't wait to get away from all these SOBs. Well, then you shipwreck them. And it turns out that they're not quite so happy with it. He says, who would be such a man of iron as to be able to endure that sort of life? Who is there from whom solitude would not snatch the enjoyment of every pleasure? This is an interesting point that he's making. We enjoy our pleasures more when there's the possibility of sharing them with other people, even if we're doing it alone, right? The proverbial drinker who drinks alone, that's enjoying something on your own, right? Um, but they might enjoy actually doing it with other people. And they talk with other people about their scotch that they enjoy or the drinks they're mixing or things like that. You take that away from them and it becomes a, you know, a pure object relation to that particular intoxicant. He, he has another uh, uh, interesting thing that he says here as well. He, he talks about this uh, saying of Archytas of Tarentum. So he says... If a man should ascend alone into heaven and behold clearly the structure of the universe and the beauty of the stars, there would be no pleasure for him in the awe-inspiring sight which would have filled him with delight if he had someone to whom he could describe what he had seen. Now, we could imagine there might be some people who actually would be totally cool with that, right? But there's a lot of us who wouldn't. And I think Cicero is really on to something. We, we shouldn't deprive ourselves of friendship solely to try to free ourselves of cares and worries. Maybe we should take on those cares and worries so that we can enjoy the greater, the greater enjoyment and the greater, we might say, moral status of being the kind of person who has friends and shares things within friendships.